it's time to look into the history of what I consider the oddball of the Spyro series, Spyro A Hero's Tale. Some people love it, some people hate it, and some people like me have mixed feelings about it. There are parts of this game which are great fun and I couldn't get enough of, and parts that I wish I could delete into oblivion. Now, I know some people might consider the Legend of Spyro series as even quirkier than A Hero's Tale, but just bear in mind that I haven't played that trilogy yet. I will do at some point, but as of writing this script, A Hero's Tale is still the black sheep of the Spyro family as far as I'm concerned. That's not to say it's bad. As I said, I really did enjoy some parts of the game. You'll see what I mean when I get to the relevant sections anyway. And before I get into the nitty gritty of A Hero's Tale, I just want to apologise to you guys for making you wait so long for this video. I've spent the last few weeks planning and moving my entire life to South Africa, so up to now my free time has been virtually non-existent. Anyway, enough idle chatter. Let's start our analysis of A Hero's Tale and go straight into… Development A Hero's Tale had a different developer compared to previous games in the series. This time it was the turn of British developers, Eurocom Entertainment Software, to come up with a fresh adventure for the plucky purple dragon. Eurocom had previously worked on titles such as Crash Bash, Disney's Tarzan, and Forty Winks to name a few, but they've developed so many games before and after A Hero's Tale that I suggest you look them all up. Unfortunately, the developers filed for bankruptcy and closed their doors in late 2012, so no more games from Eurocom. Back to the topic at hand, development of A Hero's Tale began shortly after the release of its ill-fated predecessor, Enter the Dragonfly, and the game was ready to ship by November 2004, releasing on the 9th for the US and the 12th for Europe. This would be the first time a Spyro game would appear on the Xbox, as well as the second time on the PS2 and GameCube. The developers were determined to make their own version of a Spyro game that would still fit into the series without being too far-fetched. So while you will see old faces and mechanics from previous games, you'll also see plenty of new characters and abilities. Not to mention most of those old faces have had a complete revamp in terms of appearance and personality, so they're Spyro the Dragon characters, but not as we know them. And that's all I can tell you about the development. Not a lot of info, but that seems to be the way with these later games. So let's move on to something more interesting. Story, World and Characters Like most of the Spyro games, the story for A Hero's Tale is pretty basic. The first cinematic of the game shows us a Nork, yep, those guys are back, placing a dark, foreboding gem into the grounds of the Dragon Village. As he does so, the land darkens, flowers shrink and disappear, and up sprout spiky, twisted vines. We see other Norks pouring into the Dragon Village with even more of these dark gems. Then the camera pans to reveal none other than Nasty Nork himself, Spyro's nemesis from the first game. He then commands his minions to travel through a portal to wreak havoc in other realms by planting more dark gems. Nasty Nork then signals to someone off screen and makes his way to the cave behind him. We're then introduced to the main antagonist of a hero's tale, the fallen dragon Red. Red uses his magic to block off the cave entrance with spiky vines before flying away. Okay, before I carry on, I just want to say, can developers please stop recycling bad guys? Red doesn't bother me too much, as though he is a little cliche, he's at least a new villain. But do we really need to go up against Nasty Nork again? As far as I'm concerned, I kicked his butt when I was six years old. At least give me a good reason as to why he's still alive, because this is the same issue I had when Ripto fell into lava in Spyro 2, yet still came back in Enter the Dragonfly. Anyway, rant over and back to the story. The Professor gives Spyro some brief information on Red and his dark gems, and I mean brief. All we know is that Red was once a dragon elder who became evil at some point in the past, was thought gone by all, but is back anyway and using the dark gems to slowly drain all life from the land and power his magic. So Spyro sets off across the realms to destroy the dark gems, defeat Red and save the day. But this isn't the way we're used to exploring the world. Every Spyro game I've covered up to this point has Spyro in a main homeworld, with a multitude of portals or vehicles to reach a new realm or level if you like. While these still exist here and there in A Hero's Tale, the majority of the exploration is one seamless adventure with no need for portals or loading screens. And when I mention realms in this game, I'm actually talking about the world that Spyro currently resides in. As Spyro traverses these realms and destroys more dark gems, new areas will open up. Most areas are designed to match the realm they're situated in, but there are a few exceptions. These are usually the areas that require a mode of transportation to reach. There are four main realms in A Hero's Tale. Dragon Kingdom, Lost Cities, Icy Wilderness, and Volcanic Isles. 
Each is broken up into three or four areas, with a smaller area to fight the realm's boss in. The majority of enemies you'll face in this game are Norks. It's the usual bog-standard Spyro combat. If it's big, breath attack it. If it's wearing armour, charge it, then breath attack it. Dragon Kingdom is made up of three main areas. Dragon Village is where the game starts off, a vibrant and relatively peaceful village in the hills. There's the odd Nork to deal with, but nothing too dangerous for Spyro. He'll meet not only the Professor who I mentioned earlier, but also the dreaded Moneybags, who has completely changed his ethnic background, now sporting an Arabic accent with outfit to match. Hey, check it out, Spyro. I have got a shop here too. Moneybags will crop up plenty of times in the game too, so there's no escape from him. Spyro will also run into his good old buddy and playable side character Hunter, who's less goofy than his past iterations, Zoe the Fairy who still acts as a save point throughout the game, newcomers Nanny, Flame and Ember, the latter being the dragon version of overly attached girlfriend, Still, it would look nice on an engagement ring, don't you think, Spyro? Uh... And even Elder Thomas who shares his name with Thomas of Spyro 1. In fact, all the Elder Dragons Spyro meets, bar Red himself, are named after dragons from the first game. I assume they're the same characters, even if their appearances have changed. Thomas was yellow in Spyro 1, but now he's blue. The last character Spyro will meet here once he knows how to double jump is everybody's favourite flying penguin, Sergeant Bird. I'm not a massive fan of this version, to be honest. His appearance is more or less the same as it was in Spyro 3, but his personality is completely different, and not for the better. In Spyro 3, he understood the importance of dragon eggs in his world, and helped Spyro in any way he could to retrieve them. In A Hero's Tale, however, he regards collecting dragon eggs as a waste of his time and sees more value in the light gems. At least playing him is quite fun. Moving on to the next area, and the first that differs from its realm, we have Crocoval Swamp. This dark bog is filled with Crocoval natives, blue dragon dogs, dragon-eating spiders and plants, various traps, and of course, deadly quicksand. Here, Spyro will meet another playable character, Blink. Blink is the professor's nephew and has what he describes as fresh air phobia, a fear of not being underground. He's also my most hated character in the game, I'll show you why later on. Spyro meets two more characters in Crocoval Swamp, Fredneck the Frog, who will help Spyro cross the deadly quicksand by way of his lily pads, and Elder Magnus, possibly the campiest dragon that's ever existed and nothing like his past self. Spyro, darling, you mean to learn as much as you can to help you in your quest to find red? Magnus of Spyro 1 was a sandy colour with brown spots, and sounded a lot gruffer when he talked. Also, Spyro 1 Magnus was a peacekeeper dragon, so he was quite well built, whereas a hero's tail Magnus is a little on the chubby side. Still, I'll give this version points for making me chuckle. Finally, on to Dragonfly Falls, an exotic island complete with caves, waterfalls, and tropical flora. New enemies include vultures, that will not only do damage to Spyro but also knock him into piranha-infested waters, and angry goats and their staff-wielding shepherds, which is a nice little throwback to Spyro 1. Once everything's been done in these areas, and 10 dark gems have been destroyed, Spyro can head back to Dragon Village to take on Nasty Nork, located in Nasty's cave. As he makes his way across the bridge, it begins to collapse, forcing Spyro to make a mad dash to the other side. He makes it, of course, because, come on, he's the hero of the game, and we're then introduced to this version of Nasty Nork. I'm guessing the dragons in Spyro 1 were right about him being simple, because not only does Nasty not remember the details of his previous fight with Spyro, he thinks he won it too. Spyro's not really in the mood for stupidity, and gets the fight going. The boss battles in this game are fairly repetitive, and if you're like me, you'll probably be bored halfway through wishing they were over. I'll go into more detail about each one in the gameplay section. Anyway, Spyro defeats Nasty Nork, again, which in turn releases a fairy called Amp from Nasty's mace. She blesses Spyro with electric breath. Spyro then makes his way to the Professor's teleportation device in order to go to the Lost City's realm. Another cutscene will play, showing a Nork informing Red that Nasty was defeated by a plucky purple dragon. Red takes out his frustrations on the poor Nork, freezing him solid and smashing the ice to pieces, which gives us a glimpse into more of Red's power. The camera then pans to reveal the next upcoming boss, Ineptune, a huge, ugly mermaid that reminds me of Ursula from Disney's The Little Mermaid. When Spyro arrives in Lost Cities, he'll start off in Coastal Remains, an area made up of sandy beaches, lakes, and ancient ruins. New enemies here include two different types of crabs, a smaller one that can be charged or breath attacked, and a larger one that can only be defeated by charging to knock it over and then head bashing its belly. 
There are also hostile natives and all their traps that Sparrow must avoid, as well as clams and jellyfish in the pools of water. We meet two new characters here. The first is Otto the Otter, ha ha, a surfer dude with the personality to match. He tasks Spyro with refilling his pool because, you know, he can't apparently do that himself. The second character is Turtle Mother, who tasks Spyro with protecting her offspring while they make their way to the water. The next area Spyro will visit is Sunken Ruins, which is accessed by destroying the dark gem in the large beach area and riding the elevator down. Sunken Ruins is what remains of a vast underwater city, filled with enemies such as Murnorks, Red Dragon Dogs, and Pufferfish. Spyro will meet a friendly mermaid here named Lily, though she doesn't seem to understand what Spyro is. A lot of the exploration here involves avoiding falling into acid pools until you unlock the invincibility power-up, pole swinging, elevator riding, and flipping switches, so it can get a bit tiring to navigate after a while. The last area to visit in Lost Cities is Cloudy Domain, a city high up in the sky. This one's a mixed bag for me. I love the look of the place. It's kind of Cloud Nine Realm from Enter the Dragonfly meets Cloud City from Star Wars. It's just the platforming that frustrates me. It feels awesome to jump and glide from platform to platform high above the clouds, shooting enemies out of the sky. Then you get parts like this. I mean, could you make platforming any more boring than this? Enemies in Cloudy Domain include seagulls that apparently poop explosives, and flying norks for a nice change of pace. Spyro will meet Elder Titan here, who vaguely looks like his Spyro 1 counterpart. Vaguely. He hasn't aged well either, with poor hearing and possible early signs of dementia. Quite sad, really. Once Spyro has destroyed enough dark gems, he can head back to the main hub and enter the acid-filled watery tomb to deal with a Neptune. She comments on Spyro's size, telling him he's larger than she expected, which completely throws Spyro off. She then proceeds to show off her dreadful table manners by spitting acid at Spyro, which in turn starts the fight. Once she's been defeated and sinks into the acid water, a new fairy will appear called Aqua. She grants Spyro the power of, can you guess? Yep, water breath. Spyro can now move on to the icy wilderness realm, which gives us the next cutscene involving Red. After killing yet another poor Nork out of frustration, Red brings in a new enemy to slow down Spyro, a mammoth. Spyro will arrive in Frostbite Village. This place is made up of snow-covered towns, frozen over ponds and ice caverns. Enemies include the native Eskimos and, of course, Yetis. There's always a Yeti. There are two new characters to meet here, Phil the Penguin and his wife Peggy, who both set Spyro tasks to complete. As he makes his way through the area, he'll come face to face with the mammoth from the cutscene earlier. Before Spyro can fight back, he is stomped and promptly captured by the mammoth. Sparks is also captured, but manages to find a way out and zooms off to get help. He finds Hunter practicing his archery and this is where the new area begins, Gloomy Glacier. This area is mostly made up of caves of various sizes, filled with prehistoric bones and booby traps. New enemies include large bats that swoop down to attack Hunter, and a necromancer who summons skeletal warriors to fight for him. We meet an old friend in the caves too, though he might as well be a stranger given how much the developers butchered him. Uh, uh, hey, uh, it's not my old pal Hunter. What are you doing in these parts? Yep. That is Bentley the Yeti from Spyro 3, now with just two brain cells and no fight in him whatsoever. He's been kicked out of his home by other Yetis and can't apparently chase them away himself, even though that's exactly what he did in Spyro 3 against the Rhinox. Hunter helps him out by defeating the aforementioned Yetis and we get to take a look at Bentley's home, which is pretty cool. No sign of Bartholomew though. Once Hunter makes his way to the end of Gloomy Glacier, Spyro can be found in a suspended cage in Ice Citadel. Hunter frees him and asks if he'd like help on his quest. Spyro, apparently forgetting the fact Hunter just saved his butt, rudely declines and carries on by himself. Poor Hunter, nobody appreciates you, buddy. The Ice Citadel is a large metal building and is pretty boring to look at, really. It's also well below freezing here, judging by what the resident Ice Princess tells us. Please warm this place up. It's colder than a witch's... I'm on it. New enemies include bear traps that will snap at Spyro when he gets too close, and ice golems which I couldn't seem to defeat with flame breath, only fire bombs. Spyro will meet the final elder here, who's been imprisoned in the citadel for some time given the tallies on the wall. Astor is a green dragon, whilst his Spyro 1 counterpart was a dark grey colour. He's also impatient, and sometimes rude, 
frequently cutting Spyro off mid-sentence and mentioning Spyro's ADD. Once all the Dark Gems have been destroyed, it's time to head back to Frostbite Village and deal with the big bad boss. But it's not the Mammoth we're up against, it's actually Red. I guess the Mammoth is no more, given Red's warning to it if it failed. If you let me down, you know what will happen. This has got to be one of the most irritating fights I've ever done in a Spyro game. I'll tell you why later on. Once Red has been bested, he flies out of the arena, dropping his scepter in the process and releasing a fairy named Freezer. She grants Spyro the power of Ice Breath, the most awesome breath in the game given its usefulness. Spyro can now use the Professor's teleportation device to travel to the final realm, Volcanic Isles. We're treated to another cutscene, showing Red flying to the top of a volcano, and once Spyro arrives in the first area, Stormy Beach, the Professor explains that Red has a secret laboratory hidden deep inside the volcano, and that he's going to go there himself to stop Red. I think we can already guess this is going to end in disaster. Stormy Beach is filled with old ships and cargo, which Spyro can climb to reach other areas, as well as a cave system acting as a smuggler's den. Spyro meets another unimportant NPC here, Wally the Walrus. Like the other NPCs, he's just here to give Spyro a task to complete, and then he'll never crop up again. As Spyro makes his way through the smuggler's den, he'll come across a large stone dragon head that'll open up once the dark gem in front of it is destroyed. This will lead him into the next area, Molten Mount, which is filled with pools of lava, spitting molten rock, and large dead trees. We get a nice new batch of enemies here, including phoenixes, fire imps, and rock golems. The first two can only be defeated with water or ice breath, and the third is defeated by charging into them and knocking them off the cliff reminiscent of the Earth Shapers in Spyro 2's Fracture Hills. Tina the Hyena actually sets us the task of defeating the Rock Golems as revenge for them burning down her house. The next area Spyro visits is Magma Falls, which is split into two parts and connected via a ball gadget device, Magma Falls Top and Magma Falls Bottom. It's more or less the same as the previous area in terms of enemies and design, and Spyro will need to reach the end of Magma Falls Bottom in order to move on to the next area, which is Dark Mine. Imagine a typical cartoonish evil villain mine, steam pipes, wooden structures, pools of acid, and a lot of excavation machinery. That's Dark Mine. Red has been performing all sorts of weird experiments in his lab, namely turning his Nork minions into robots. These Robo Norks are a lot tougher to take down, being immune to flame breath, and some possessing ranged attacks that can hit Spyro from a fair distance. Luckily, they're vulnerable to electric and ice breath, other enemies include haywire robots which can either attack Spyro head-on or use turrets, and frilled dragon dogs that can breathe fire. The last area of the game is Red's laboratory. Just like Dark Mine, this is your typical bad guy secret underground lab, with consoles lining the walls, wires running across the ceilings and floors, deadly laser traps, and Robonorks. Robonorks everywhere. The only NPCs you'll come across in Red's laboratory are the maintenance robots that keep everything running. Once the final dark gem of the game is destroyed, it's time to take on Red and defeat him once and for all. Spyro enters the main part of the lab to find the Professor, who has been captured by Red and forced to create his robot army. Thanks a lot, Professor. Red makes his appearance, and Spyro is dumb enough to knock him into the Nork conversion machine, turning Red into a robot himself. And the Professor can't let the game end without doing Spyro in one more time. So in an effort to help out, he accidentally enlarges Red. Professor, I will kill you myself, I swear. A fairly long-winded fight ensues, but ultimately, our plucky purple dragon comes out victorious. Red is changed back to a normal dragon, and then shrunk down to bug size to be placed in a glass jar, keeping him out of trouble. And then the game ends, because why not? There is a secret ending if you 100% complete the game, but honestly, it's pretty terrible for how long that takes to do, and I just couldn't be bothered. If you want to check it out, look up A Hero's Tale Secret Ending on YouTube. I guarantee you'll be disappointed. So let's wrap up this part and move on to... Gameplay! In terms of controlling Spyro, some commands are the same as previous games, others are new, and the rest will leave you scratching your head. Spyro starts off with some basic abilities, and as he visits each elder, he'll learn something new. Perhaps the biggest head-scratcher most people talk about is the swapping of circle and square. Every game up to this point uses square to charge and circle to breath attack, but a hero's tail wants to be different, and different apparently means mixing up the button commands. 
Needless to say, I was caught out a few times at the beginning of the game when I dashed off a platform instead of breathing fire on the nearby chests. Gliding's been changed too, but I kind of like it now. In previous games, you'd press X to jump, X again to glide, then press triangle at the end of your jump to hover and gain more height. That was about the extent of your control while gliding. If you stopped midway, you couldn't start gliding again, and Spyro would fall to his death in most cases. In A Hero's Tale, Spyro learns the ability to double jump by pressing X and then X again, but loses his hover ability, so you're effectively gaining the height before you start gliding. Letting go of the X button will stop Spyro's glide, but holding it down again will continue it. Also, to make things a little easier for those trickier ledges, Spyro will grab onto the edge just in case he doesn't quite clear the top. I found the ledge grab to be hit and miss though, so it's best not to rely on it. As I mentioned before, each elder Spyro visits will teach him a new ability. Elder Thomas teaches him how to horn dive, which is necessary in order to destroy all the dark gems scattered about the realms. Horn dive functions the same as head bash from previous games, and is performed by double jumping, then pressing the circle button. Elder Magnus teaches Spyro how to pole spin, because of course he does. It's fairly simple to perform. All you have to do is jump towards the pole to grab on, then press X to jump to the next pole. Changing direction is as simple as pushing in the opposite direction with the analog stick. Next up is Elder Titan, who teaches Spyro Wing Shield, performed by pressing and holding triangle. I personally never use the Wing Shield in normal combat. It's not as awful as the one in Enter the Dragonfly, but I'd still rather outmaneuver and kill the enemy before they throw a projectile at me. Finally, Elder Astor will teach Spyro the Wall Kick ability, performed by jumping between two close together walls and pretty much mashing X all the way to the top. Spyro's other mechanic, which is worth going into detail about, is his various breath attacks. Fire, electric, water, and ice. Each breath can be selected by using the D-pad on the PS2 controller. We all know fire breath, so let's talk about electric breath first. It's mostly used to power switches and devices which you'll find in pretty much every area of the game. It can be used to defeat enemies, but it takes longer to do so than fire breath, so I never really used it as my main attack and just stuck with fire breath for the majority of the game. The next one you learn is incredibly useless in my opinion. Water breath cannot defeat enemies, only stun them, and it's used for the odd water device that needs to be turned on or for pushing objects. Okay, it can kill phoenixes and fire imps that appear later in the game, but so can ice breath. I feel like water breath only exists so that the player gets a reward for killing the big bad boss. By far the most useful is of course the one you get last, ice breath. Unlike Enter the Dragonfly, where Ice Breath felt pointless due to fire or electric breath killing enemies faster, Ice Breath in A Hero's Tale bypasses the process of having to knock off an enemy's armour by letting you freeze any enemy regardless of size or shield. All you then have to do is charge into them to kill them. Not to mention it has quite a large spread. I was freezing enemies that the Ice Breath particles didn't even seem to touch. Gotta love those hitboxes! I may as well mention the bomb ammo Sparrow can pick up and spit as well. This ammo comes in four varieties just like Spyro's breath attacks. Fire bombs, ball lightnings, aqua bombs and ice missiles. They can be thrown by tapping R1 and thrown even further by holding down R1. To be honest, I hardly use the bombs and never felt like they were a necessary part of the game, so I don't have footage to show you of all their different effects. Sorry! In all, Spyro's mechanics and abilities whilst navigating through the realms feel very smooth and responsive, making platforming and combat with him pretty enjoyable. Especially so when you remember that this came out after Enter the Dragonfly, and the platforming and combat in that was… not great. Of course, Spyro isn't the only character to play as in A Hero's Tale. There's Sparks the Dragonfly, Hunter the Cheetah, Flink the Mole, and Sergeant Bird the Penguin. Everybody bar Hunter is involved in minigames, and each minigame needs to be completed twice to collect all the available items, first for a dragon egg, and then again for a light gem. Dragon eggs aren't necessary to collect, given they're only used to unlock cosmetic skins, artwork, model viewers and so on. Light gems are the important items in the game, as Spyro needs to collect enough of them in order to unlock the Professor's various gadgets and power-ups. But seeing as you get the dragon egg first on each minigame, you're going to collect a fair few regardless. So back to the side characters. I want to start with Hunter and Blink first, because, like Spyro, their gameplay involves platforming. Except, while I found Hunter very rewarding to play, I thought Blink was absolutely terrible. So what can Hunter do? Well, obviously he can't glide or breathe fire like Spyro, but he can leap pretty far and high with his double jump. 
He also has a stomp attack that's the same as Sparrow's Horn Dive. Then there's that nifty bow of his that can be used to take out enemies from afar and break open chests. The bow can either be used manually by holding L1 and firing with square, or automatically by waiting for the reticle to appear on enemies and chests and then hitting square. Hunter can even find and use explosive arrows for a bit of extra kick, usable by pressing R1. These are necessary in order to break open certain walls and find goodies inside. He's not useless in close quarters combat either, able to deliver a nasty dash punch with circle button and even use his bow as a melee weapon by hitting square whilst in the air. He can also perform a flying kick the same way by pressing circle, but I don't think I ever use this in combat. The last nifty thing Hunter can do is wall climb, by running up to a climbable surface and jumping onto it. He'll then dig his claws in and you can move him vertically or horizontally. While I only made use of Hunter twice during my playthrough, he was certainly fun to play. And given that he's integral in saving Spyro at one point, I don't feel like he's an unnecessary addition to the game. So what about Blink? Well, take a mix of Spyro and Hunter's abilities, jiggle them around a bit, and make everything feel ten times slower, and you have Blink. Honestly, I really didn't enjoy playing him. In fact, I found him so awful to play that I gave up midway through his last minigame in Volcanic Isles. Blink's minigames involve going underground and destroying all the dark gems he can find there, but they aren't all located in the same area. That would be too easy and make this character less tedious to play, so Blink will have to make use of his digging, climbing, and wall kicking abilities to reach them. I would say his jumping abilities too, but both Spyro and Hunter put him to shame in that regard. Digging is accomplished by pressing circle and can only be used on certain surfaces. Doing so will move Blink into a new section of the minigame and act as a checkpoint for him, so at least if you die you don't have to start right at the beginning. Wall kicking is pretty much the same as Spyro's, except Blink can cling indefinitely to the wall. Butt bounce is the same as horn dive, and monkey barring along the ceiling is the same as Hunter's wall climb. You're just going forwards and backwards rather than up and down. Blink has two other abilities up his sleeve. He can use his laser blaster to destroy boxes and kill enemies, albeit very slowly. It's basically a crap version of Hunter's bow. Not to mention, if it's shot too much, it overheats. His other ability is picking up and using bombs to blow stuff up. These are necessary to destroy dark gems and metal crates, as Blink has no other way to do so, but even this isn't smooth sailing. You're supposed to be able to tap R1 for a short throw and hold it down and release for a longer throw, but I sometimes found tapping R1 would do nothing, and other times it would throw out two bombs instead of just one. Other times, the sound effect for throwing a bomb wouldn't even play, meaning I would catch myself out and take an unnecessary hit. At least the developers put in a crouch ability for Blink, to stop him taking damage from explosions, accomplished by pressing triangle, assuming you actually realise he's trying to kamikaze himself. The worst part of it all though is getting the first minigame done, and then realising that if you want that sweet light gem, you're going to have to come back and do it all over again, with twice as many dark gems to destroy. Now you can see why I hate Blink so much. So let's move on to Sparks and his minigames. While travelling through each realm, you'll occasionally find cracks in the walls that are impossible for Spyro to fit through. This is where Sparks comes in. His minigames are basically rail shooters and require him to go from point A to point B. Sounds simple enough, but on the way, waves of bugs will try to stop him, as well as other creatures related to the realm Spyro's in. Sparks can shoot out an endless stream of bullets by holding down X, which can also be temporarily upgraded into rapid fire by collecting the red spinning items. He can even collect missiles and use them by pressing square. The best weapon he has though is the smart bomb. They're not commonly found, and for good reason. They can destroy every enemy in the screen with one triangle click. It's not just enemies that'll damage sparks. He'll have to avoid falling rocks, doors that smash shut continuously, and tunnel entrances that need to be opened by hitting switches. Luckily, sparks can speed himself up, or put on the brakes with R1 and L1 respectively. Just be careful that you don't run out of turbo boost. I found the Sparks minigames quite entertaining, the only thing I would say was that the difficulty level was a complete mix. By far the hardest one to do in my opinion was only the second one of the game. The combination of slamming doors, falling rocks and spiders throwing webs was very difficult to deal with. I got there in the end though, and it's still infinitely more entertaining than Blink's minigames. Finally we come to Sergeant Bird and his minigames, which have taken the old speedway idea and changed things up a teeny bit. As you know, Speedways of previous games were a fairly bog-standard affair. Fly through or destroy the various objectives before time runs out. The route you needed to take was pretty obvious too, usually starting out with rings, then moving on to whatever was in your field of view. 
Spyro 3 and Enter the Dragonfly even included races against the inhabitants of said speedways. The speedways of A Hero's Tale do things a little differently. The biggest change, of course, is that it's Sergeant Bird completing them, not Spyro. There doesn't seem to be an obvious route to take either, at least I couldn't work out where to go, and spent most of my time flying around aimlessly, hoping to spot that last archway. There's also no races in these speedways. Coming back a second time for the light gem has you doing the same thing, only with less time and more spread out objectives. In terms of his abilities, Sergeant Bird is very enjoyable to play. I never found his flying awkward or slow, and he can in fact be sped up by collecting the booster fuel barrels located in certain areas of the speedway. To make Sergeant Bird fly, hold down X to thrust him into the air. It can also be let go in order to drop speed or altitude, just make sure you don't hit the ground or he'll be temporarily stunned. Speed him up by holding down square at the same time as X, but this will only work for as long as he has booster fuel. Sergeant Bird has two weapons at his disposal, bombs that can be dropped out of the sky, and missiles that lock on and chase down a target. While the help menu informs you that bombs are better for ground targets and missiles for aerial targets, I found the missiles were effective at both. Playing Sergeant Bird was a pleasant change from the usual platforming of a hero's tale, and of course, it's awesome to see old faces from past games make an appearance. Besides the mini-games involving each character, there's two that Spyro can do himself. The first type, the turret mini-game, is given to you by those random NPCs that crop up once and are never heard from again. These vary in objective, but basically have you shooting enough enemies to fill a bar to max. For each enemy that isn't killed and escapes, a separate bar will fill up. You've got to get your bar to full first, simple as that. The controls are simple too, using only square to fire shells and the analogue stick to move the turrets. The first turret minigame is given to you by Fredneck the Frog. The local dragon dogs and swamp bats keep stealing his supplies, so shoot them before they gobble everything up. The next one is given to you by Turtle Mother, her babies are trying to make their way to the sea, but are constantly being picked off by vultures and crabs, so Sparrow will need to kill all the enemies to give the baby turtles a clear path. Next up is Peggy the Penguin, who tasks Spyro with shooting all the yetis and eskimoles that have taken over her beloved skating rink. Lastly, Wally the Walrus needs Spyro to take out the invading norks that are storming the beach and causing havoc in the volcanic isles. I found these minigames very easy to complete, even on the second round though that could be down to all the time I spend playing Overwatch. The second type of minigame involves a gadget that the Professor has invented, so I may as well talk a bit about his other creations. Throughout his travels, Spyro will be helped along by the Professor, who will invent new things to make Spyro's life easier. The first you'll use is the ball gadget, which basically is the second minigame. It looks like a giant hamster ball, and is used to travel to new areas in the realm, such as the one that connects Dragon Village and Dragonfly Falls. Entering the ball gadget will move Spyro to a separate area, usually with obstacles to avoid and a light gem to collect at the end. The ball gadget minigames start off simple, but get gradually more difficult the further you progress in the game. You'll need to collect enough light gems before the ball gadget will activate. The next device that you'll use far more frequently if you're going for 100% completion is the Professor's Teleporter. Spyro will need this to travel back and forth between the realms, though the experience of teleporting isn't pleasant for him. Certainly gives the old system a thorough workout, eh? Yeah, right. Like being sucked down a giant drain. Next up is the power-ups, of which there are two. Invincibility and supercharge can be accessed via the pads you find on the ground. Just like the ball gadget, they require enough light gems in order to function, and if you're going for 100% completion, you're gonna need these power-ups. Invincibility is mainly used in sunken ruins to dive into the acid pools, and molten mount to walk on the lava lakes. You'll know Spyro is invincible because he'll look just like the T-1000 from Terminator 2. As far as I remember, I only use Supercharge and Ice Citadel to travel up the steep areas that Spyro can't normally run up. I know there are more areas in the game that utilise Supercharge, but I never actually went back to them given I wasn't trying to collect everything. Supercharge activation will give Spyro a glowing, slightly blurry aura. Seeing as I've mentioned the Professor's devices and power-ups, I may as well talk about the elephant in the room, or rather bear in the shop. Ah, there you are, my favourite wallet. Before that though, I should mention gems and their role in the hero's tale. Previous games included gems as part of the huge collectathon, with a certain amount to find in each realm. This time, however, there's an endless supply of gems as they're necessary to buy all the items in Moneybag's shop. If you leave an area and come back a little later, all the gems you picked up will have magically respawned. I really don't like this change. Part of the fun of the old Spyro games was seeking out that last pesky gem that was in a well-hidden or difficult-to-reach area. 
Ironically, trying to give the gems value by making them currency for use in Moneybag's shop has made them feel utterly worthless to collect, seeing as most of the items he sells I don't care to buy. So what does everybody's most hated Ursine sell anyway? Restocked items are lockpicks, the elemental bomb ammo I mentioned earlier, butterfly jars that restore sparks to full health, double value gems, and teleport passes. There are magazine upgrades for the elemental bombs which do technically restock, but only up to 8 times each. Out of all these items, I only bought lockpicks regularly, because you need them to unlock the treasure chests you find scattered about the realms containing dragon eggs and light gems. I bought the butterfly jars a couple of times, usually before boss fights, and only bought the double value gem and teleport pass once. One-off items at Moneybag's shop include a keychain that allows Sparks to carry up to three lockpicks instead of one, an upgrade to Sparrow's horn dive to give it a wider area of effect, and an extra health unit to allow Sparks to take one more hit, which will make him go from green to red before disappearing. All these items understandably cost far more than the usual restocked items, but they add a better quality of life to the game, so they're worth spending the gems on. Plus, halfway through the game, I had more gems than I really needed, so buying this stuff was trivial. Moneybag's shop can be found in the main hub of every realm, but don't worry if you're miles away. He's made the buying process even easier by installing remote shop pads all over the place. Just remember there's a 25% markup on all items bought at these pads, so spend wisely. The last thing to pick apart in this section is the boss fights, as I didn't go into much detail before. So as I said, the boss fights are a fairly repetitive and boring affair, at least I didn't find them that entertaining. Each boss fight is broken into three parts, and if you fail on, say, the second part, you won't have to go right back to the beginning of the fight, just start the second part again. Thank goodness too, because these fights go on for a while. The first boss, Nasty Nork, is fairly straightforward. He'll smash the ground with his mace, which will either send out waves of energy, tornadoes, or a combination of the two. As long as there's enough distance between Spyro and Nasty, he can easily jump or dodge out of the way. Every so often, Nasty will get his mace stuck in the ground, which is the perfect opportunity to burn his butt. In the second phase, he'll continue to use the same attacks, but he'll throw in the cliché ceiling falling down attack. Again, this attack can easily be avoided by watching the floor for the shadows of falling rocks. The third phase has Nasty dropping most of his abilities in favour of lightning attacks. Now when he smashes the ground, balls of electricity will come flying out, that Spyro will need to double jump and fly over. The second lightning attack involves a trail of electricity emanating from Nasty's mace. This will chase after Spyro, but can easily be outrun. Overall, this was a fairly easy fight. I died once because I was standing too close to avoid the energy blast, and with deaths, it took me around five and a half minutes to finish. The next boss, Ineptune, was slightly more difficult for me, mainly because I couldn't get the camera to work with me and kept falling off the edge of the platform into acid. Also, I just suck in general. The fight will start with a Neptune throwing balls of acid at Spyro, then spewing acid out from her mouth. Depending on which attack it is, Spyro will have to outrun the damage or jump over it. Once she's done this initial attack, she'll stop moving for a few seconds, giving time for Spyro to charge attack the gem on her belt. When she recovers, she'll dive under the platform Spyro is standing on and remove a segment of it to replace with a laser beam device. Spyro will need to jump over the laser to avoid damage. After a few turns, the laser beam device will disappear and the segment of platform will return to normal. The second phase is the same, except this time, two segments of platform are replaced with the laser beams, making avoiding damage even harder. The third phase is the same as the second phase, except the laser beams move a bit faster. Overall, I found this fight challenging, but as I said, that's partly down to the camera angle making it difficult to see the platform edge. I died three times in this fight, and with deaths, it took me around nine minutes to finish. Next up, we have the first fight with Red, and oh my gosh, this has got to be the worst fight in Spyro history, on account of its unfair difficulty and tediously long sections of nothingness. This might actually bring the Yeti boxing match in Spyro 3 down a peg or two in my bad books. The fight will initially start with Red sending out ice magic to freeze Spyro solid, but as long as Spyro is using wing shield, he can't be hit. For some unknown reason, the developers decided to make this part of the fight go on for 20 seconds at a time. That's 20 seconds of standing still and holding down triangle. I think later on in this fight, I actually started browsing Facebook to kill time. When Red decides the whole ice thing really ain't working, he'll move on to spawning crates of explosives. I'm really not sure what the reasoning is behind spawning them. All Red does is explode each one individually. He doesn't even push them towards Spyro. The goal is to use water breath to set them ticking and push them towards Red. It's supposed to do damage to him, 
but more often than not, after I pushed the crates into him and they exploded, nothing happened. I thought maybe I was doing something wrong, but after looking at other people's videos of this fight, I was doing exactly what they were, so I have no clue what was going on. Couple that with the fact Red will fly into the air if he catches you pushing the crates towards him, and you can start to see why I really don't like this fight. Rinse and repeat this whole phase a couple of times until the second phase begins. This time, Red will summon Dragon Dogs to attack Spyro, drop ice from the ceiling when he stomps his foot, and still cast ice spells to try and freeze Spyro's solid, so a lot of damage to avoid. If you manage to survive this onslaught, and push the exploding crates into Red a couple more times, you'll move into the third phase. This time, Red will melt part of the ice platform Spyro is standing on to give him less room to move. Then he'll keep turning towards Spyro to try and burn him with fire breath. After this, he'll cast an ice spray spell and chase Spyro with it. Luckily, this brings the ice platform back to its usual size. Now comes the unfair part of the fight. Note on the edge of the platform those energy devices. Red will turn these on, which will send out lines of laser beams, first clockwise, then anti-clockwise, which Spyro will need to jump over. The lines are incredibly difficult to avoid, even if you're standing as close to the edge of the platform as you can, and given that the devices they come from spin round to a random position, you'll sometimes find they shoot out laser beams straight on top of Spyro's head. My other favourite thing they do? When Spyro takes damage from the beam, it knocks him back, which then makes him take damage again because the same beam is still coming towards him. If you can get through this nightmare part of the third phase, the rest is fairly straightforward. Avoid falling ice, wing shield, and blow Red up with explosive crates. By the end of this fight, I racked up 6 deaths, and with those, the fight took me a whopping 19 minutes to complete. The last fight against Red, or Mecha Red if you like, is thankfully a lot easier than the previous. Mecha Red will start off by spewing out bouncing bombs that will chase Spyro before exploding. He'll then stomp the ground, sending out a wave of energy and causing sheets of metal to fall from the ceiling. Honestly, who do they contract to build these places? Next, he'll use his eye beams to chase Spyro along the platform. Mecha Red will then change back to normal sized Red. Rockets will then appear from below the ground, which Spyro can light with his fire breath, and send into Red to do significant damage to him. Red will transform back into Mecha Red and repeat the same attacks, but this time he'll also send out a jet of fire with his rocket boots. He'll then transform into normal Red again. Instead of rockets, Spyro will need to zap the generators to give Red a nasty shock, all while avoiding the bouncing bombs. Back to Mecha Red once more, and this time he swaps his jet of fire attack for missiles, but they're a lot easier to dodge than the former. This time when he transforms back into Red, he'll be surrounded by Robo Norks, who will initially attack Spyro until Spyro Horn dives a switch. This will make them turn on Red and fire their lasers at him. Repeat this process until Red runs out of health and you're done. I managed to not die at all fighting Mecha Red, and the whole process took about 6.5 minutes. And that's pretty much it for gameplay. If I've forgotten anything significant, I can't remember what it would be, so let's move on to… Music and voice work A Hero's Tale was the first Spyro game on main consoles that Stuart Copeland did not compose the music for. Instead, that role went to British composers Steve Duckworth and Paul Lawler. Duckworth started his video game music career with Eurocom way back in 1993, and stayed with the developers until they closed their doors in 2012, so he's worked on soundtracks for pretty much every game they developed. He now works at 8 Pixel Square, based just outside of Derby in the UK. From what I found out about Lawler, he's a freelance composer who started off writing scores for the likes of the BBC and other TV stations, before moving on to video game music. Quoting DeWolfMusic.com's page about him, Paul now works from an analogue and modular synthesizer laden studio in an old Victorian vicarage out on the Lancashire Hills. I'm not a music nerd, so analogue and modular synthesizer means nothing to me, but it sounds pretty cool. So let's talk about the soundtrack of A Hero's Tale, and this is where my non-nerdy musicness lets me down again, so please forgive me. It would have been easy enough to copy Stuart Copeland's style because after all, A Hero's Tale is still part of the main Spyro series. Instead, the composers came up with a soundtrack that feels a lot more bouncy and upbeat. Playing through A Hero's Tale, I get the impression the game was really intended for kids, more so than any other entry in the series. Not to say I didn't enjoy playing it myself, but between characters breaking the fourth wall, crude humour, and very cliched story and villains, you definitely get the impression A Hero's Tale was made for kids, and the soundtrack reflects that too. Unfortunately, bouncy and upbeat doesn't always equal memorable, and most of the tracks from A Hero's Tale are pretty forgettable to me. I mean, when I actually sit down and take the time to listen, I like them, 
but I feel a lot of the tracks don't add anything to the area they play in, and so you forget there's even music to begin with. It's background noise, basically. The only track in the game which I thought really complemented its area was the Cloudy Domain theme. Making those death-defying jumps and glides, trying to avoid the flying norks throwing boomerangs and magic at you, all while those trumpets boomed in the background and that choir sang angelically. One word. Awesome. Let's move on from the soundtrack and talk about the voice work in A Hero's Tale, because there have been some big changes in that department, namely the entire voice cast being replaced. The only two voice actors to return are Michael Goff, reprising his role as Nasty Nork as well as taking on the role of the Professor, and Andre Soliuzo, returning to voice Sparks. Funnily enough, even with the same voice actors, the characters don't sound the same at all. Admittedly, Nasty Nork only had three lines and a bunch of accompanying grunts in Spyro 1, but he sounds slightly higher pitched and nasally in A Hero's Tale. Spyro, it's been a while since I last defeated you in battle. The professor doesn't sound the same either. I thought I could stop him after you had weakened him. But that's understandable given that Goff is filling in for Tom Kenny's voice. Sparks has had the biggest change, of course, because now he actually speaks rather than buzzes. Spyro always used to send me into cracks like this. A trend that will carry on in future Spyro games, though not with Soliuzo as his voice actor. The oddest voice change, in my opinion, is Spyro's, now voiced by Jess Harnell. Wow, a million brain cells? That seems excessively destructive. Oh, that seems kind of bad. Okay, okay, it's cool! Perhaps it's because I've been used to Tom Kenny's voice for the last three games, but I can't put my finger on why I don't like it. It's possibly because Harnell makes Sparrow sound very nasally, like he has a cold or something. It could also be down to the writing. Sparrow comes across as quite mean and snarky at times during A Hero's Tale, which makes him a very unlikable character to me. Still, that isn't Harnell's fault, and I'll give him points for his interesting take on the voice of Spyro. He also voices Hunter. Um, are you sure you're okay, Bentley? I could go in there with my bows and arrows and get rid of them for you. Money bags. Hey, check it out, Spyro. I have got a shop here too. Red. I cannot believe this. What is going on around here? Do I have to deal with Spyro myself? And all the Dragon Elders of A Hero's Tale. For those unfamiliar with his work outside of the Spyro series, Jess Harnell has also voiced Wacko Warner of Animaniacs, and even Crash Bandicoot, Ripperoo, and Pinstripe from the rebooted Insane trilogy. Moving on, we have Tara Strong, probably the best known voice actress in, like, the whole world. Her roles in A Hero's Tale are fairly limited, a shame given she's talented at what she does. She voices Blink the Mole, Yep, I bet I'd make a great sidekick. If it weren't for my fresh aerophobia. Both Flame and Ember. The force field has disappeared. I thought I was going to be trapped in here forever. Maybe the Dragon Elder can tell you how to smash it into bits. Zoe the Fairy. Hey there, Spyro. When I zap you with my wand like this, your current position in progress is saved. And Tina the Hyena. Those rock monsters burned down my house. <laughs> I'm actually quite sad. <laughs> Outside of Spyro, she has had hundreds of voice acting roles, her most popular being Raven from Teen Titans, Twilight Sparkle from My Little Pony, and Bubbles from the Powerpuff Girls. There are other voice actors who had various roles in the game, but the majority of the characters only appeared briefly or spoke a few lines, so I won't go into detail on each one. Let's move on to the final part of this video before I lose my voice. Critical Reception A Hero's Tale received mixed to positive reviews on release. One thing most critics unanimously agreed on was that it was definitely a step up from Enter the Dragonfly, and I concur. Whereas its predecessor felt rushed and sloppily made, with glitches and bugs abound, A Hero's Tale was an incredibly smooth game from start to finish. Movement and combat feels great, the voice acting isn't bad, and the realms Spyro explores are gorgeous to look at. However, some critics weren't impressed with Eurocom's lack of innovation, stating that nothing new had been brought to the game, despite the developers trying to make their own unique mark on the series. GameSpot were particularly scathing, stating, Today, modest improvements on this tired formula, like giving Spyro's once vestigial T-Rex-like arms the ability to grip ledges, just aren't enough to make the game feel innovative. Filling the title with disruptive and boring mini-games to artificially increase playtime apparently wasn't a good move either. 
Despite all the new window dressing, Spyro A Hero's Tale is the same game you played six years ago, and you probably remember it being better. IGN was slightly kinder, stating, Spyro A Hero's Tale delivers a decent amount of fun. While lacking innovation in style and play mechanics, the game controls well, and offers enough challenge and length to warrant a hard look by parents looking to buy a game for their kids. In the end, A Hero's Tale is a definite improvement over Enter the Dragonfly. It's a solid, albeit simple and slightly unimaginative platformer. To this day, on game rankings, the PS2 version of Spyro A Hero's Tale holds a 64.59% ranking based on 22 reviews. So to wrap up, what do I think of A Hero's Tale? Well, even though I played this way back when I was 12 years old, I genuinely couldn't remember anything about the game. I don't know whether that's because 12 year old me found it too hard or fairly forgettable, but adult me still finds it both those things. It's not a bad game. Yes, it's a different formula to the usual Spyro the Dragon, and there were some parts of gameplay that I would delete into oblivion if I could. Curse you blink. But overall, it's not bad. It's certainly an improvement on Enter the Dragonfly, that's for sure. But nothing really stood out for me while playing, and there were some things about the game that bugged me. I know Yorocon wanted to make their own spin-off Spyro game, but there are some things I wish they hadn't changed or removed. I miss having a finite amount of gems to hunt down, travelling through a portal and wondering what strange unique world I'd end up in. I even miss the original formula for minigames. There isn't enough variety in the minigames of A Hero's Tale, and making players have to repeat them twice, even those really nasty blink ones, is a gaming sin. Overall, Spyro A Hero's Tale is an okay but forgettable game for me. I'd love to hear what you guys think about it though, so let me know by leaving a comment. Thank you so much for watching, and join me next time when I make a start on the Legend of Spyro series, starting with A New Beginning, which should be fun as I've never played those games before. See you later guys!